It's going to be a phenomenal seminar. I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to have the one and only Matt Dees as our guest today. Thanks so much, Matt, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. It's going to be great. We're, we have so much to talk about. Um, I have a bunch of your wine here. You have a great wine for your burgers. When you're, uh, <laughs> exactly. It's and, Friday, uh, I think. I think it's Friday. Friday. I think it is Friday also. And um, before we just dive in, you know, our goal is to use these to, to use this time to bring us all a little bit together in this crazy discombobulated world that we're living in right now. And we, we, we would really love to make these seminars be interactive. So please give us your questions. And the sooner we have your questions, the more we can weave them into the discussion. You know, we've had a few of these seminars, Matt, where like all the questions come in at the last 10 minutes. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's such a great question. You know, we, need, we, need, we need the proper answer. So, um, but anyway, uh, thanks again for your time on a Friday. I, I hope you and your family are staying safe in this bizarre world right now. You know, so, we've been, all things considered, we're very blessed. Okay. We're feeling, we're feeling good. Good. And the, the teams at the wineries? You know, everybody's great. We, um, we have those a facility in Lompoc and a facility in Buellton and our two estate vineyards. And we've been able to, to stay separate, keep six, six feet and get our work done. We're still incredibly busy. So we're, we're going full steam ahead. Cool. Um, you have a pretty, in, I think a very interesting path that's taking you to Santa Barbara. What, how did you get into the whole wine business in the first place? Well, I grew up in the fine winemaking mecca of Kansas City, obviously. <laughs> exactly. The only way to go, you know. Um, learned everything there. You know, I, I was a kid who loved plants. I was a kid who, who was just taken with insects. Um, it appears to be genetic. My children appear to have it, or whatever that <laughs> bug gene is. And then I moved to Vermont, which is maybe the second finest fine winemaking mecca in the world. And, you know, I went to University of Vermont to Groovy Uvi, and in 97, 98, I, I was able to plant a vineyard with a gentleman there and make ice wine and make Vidal Blanc and Saval Blanc, Vignol, Chambersin, you know, all those Baca Noir. And, you know, just got bit by the bug then. And one day in, in Vermont, it was, you know, negative 20 degrees outside, and I was digging the vines up with a pickaxe, basically, to see if they had survived. And it was snowing and miserable. And I thought, you know, maybe there's somewhere in the world where the sun shines and, you know, the grapes don't frost at 19 bricks. And, you know, I moved out to Napa, made wine with the Staglin family for years um, with Andy Erickson, um, moved to New Zealand, made wine with Doug Weiser. That's a great story how you got that job. Didn't you just like write him a, a, an email or a letter and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. And he said, yeah, come on out. Oh, those are the old days. <laughs> like I went to my brother, I was a college kid. I didn't have any money. So my brother bought me a bottle of 95 Staglin Family Cabernet from Sherry Lehman in the city. And I was beside myself, that beautiful bottle, Rutherford Bench, you know, Shelichev, you know, and I, I opened that bottle and it just, I had never tasted anything like that. It wasn't quite like Vermont Baca Noir, needless to say. Not exactly. Which is actually, I mean, we made some killer wines in Vermont. I still blind people and I think they're also uh, SGNs, but um, honestly, but, but you know, the, the, the Staglin wine just, I had never seen texture like that, velvet. And they put their phone number on the back and it was actually their phone number. I mean, you literally called it and it was, you know, Sherry Staglin. And I said, look, I, I'm this kid from Kansas who makes wine in Vermont, can I come work with you? And she was incredibly sweet and wonderful. And basically said, hey, we don't have anywhere for you to work. And I basically said, well, I have a ticket to Oakland tomorrow. Could I stop by around noon? <laughs> And then they became family and they were still to this day, some of my nearest and dearest friends. That's and a yeah, family. got lucky, right yeah. place, right time. Well, I, you know, anybody who knows me knows I don't believe in luck, but. <laughs> you have to put yourself in the position, right? You have to put yourself in the position. So then you went to Napa and you made wines with Eric, with Andy for a few years, right? Yeah, who's a, who's a beautiful human being and an incredibly yeah. talented guy. And yeah, sure. I showed up in 01. And then we made the O2 together, O3. Um, O2 is a pretty before. famous wine. The O2? Yeah. It's a killer wine. Yeah. Oh, Brad, Brad Grimes. He's one of your biggest fans. <laughs> I love me some Brad Grimes. But yeah, he, yeah that O2 is, boy, the, the stars aligned. I mean, the vineyard just was perfect, immaculate that year. Yeah. But, you know, and then going to New Zealand and working with a young kid, you know, Doug Weiser, who at the time was probably 25 and was from, you know, had worked with Literai and Ted and 
was just a, a ferociously talented gentleman. And between he and Andy, I really, I learned everything I know. Pretty and good then, teachers, right? Yeah, and then, the, you know, Andy called me when I left uh, Craigie Range in 04, and he said, you know, I found you a head winemaking job in Santa Barbara and being kind of a country bumpkin. My response was, I don't know, is Santa Barbara nice? And he basically hung up the phone. <laughs> so I've been here since 04, I'm getting old. So then, and then, so then, then what happened? Yeah, I showed up here and I started with Honada. I came on for the first vintage of this, you know, giant sand dune in the middle of Ballard Canyon. And I, it was kind of like landing on the moon. And now there's nowhere I'd rather be on this earth making wine than, than Ballard Canyon and Santa Rita Hills. But th there's a really pretty famous story about you guys hiring a famous vi French soil specialist, or maybe, I don't know if that's what he was, or agronomist, but somebody basically decided, told you that Honata was perfect soil for growing asparagus, right? Yeah, oh God, yeah. That, talk about like, you know, when you start a new winery in a fairly new region, there's like having a fire lit under you is the greatest thing possible. Yeah, and we brought over a gentleman from Bordeaux, quite a fantastic, impressive human being, but honest, bluntly honest. And yeah, we said, here are 600 acres. Here's a dune buggy. Go drive around for two days. Let us know what to grow, where we should plant it. And basically gave us the asparagus everywhere <laughs> was his response. And it's really good. I mean, we grow incredible asparagus, but thankfully we grew what I call the entire Noah's Ark, right? Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Viognier, Grenache, Syrah, Sanjo, Merlot, Cab Franc, Cab Sat, Petit Verdot, and Petit Syrah. These are young regions and, and the rules aren't written yet. We're still, we're still doing our due, due diligence and, and learning for sure. Yeah, you know, I remember the first time I went to Ballard Canyon, uh, I took that road that passes by your place, by Rusak, by Larner. Yeah. yeah. And it looks like a David Hockney painting, you know, like these dips and like this and these wide open hillsides and ranches. And I just thought it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen in the world. It just takes your breath away. And there's, there's uh, nothing I thought the wine good. Otherwise, it would be just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, but it's interesting, you know, Antonio. You you have you have tracked the progress of this young region and have a very intimate relationship, just because you always came out to to learn about it, and you had such this incredibly open mind and and belief in the region. So you have as good of an idea of of what's happening in this region as anybody. I've always been very impressed. Well, when I you come visit and you, we hear you ask questions. I'm like, that is, that that really digs to the the base of, of the issues out here, and it's 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 always been something I've I've really admired. Oh, well, thanks. It's it's a pleasure, and, and I mean, it is a I think. Well, all of we'll talk about a lot of Santa Barbara because you have vineyards in a lot of Santa Barbara, different areas. But Ballard Canyon, just in and of itself, is a just so interesting you know and then all the vineyards and I mean obviously you make wines for other people too like Kimsey which is really interesting uh, but the Larner vineyard is really interesting and I just think that um, you know I'm sure I'm forgetting some but I mean it's just really every time I go this year you know I mean I'm hopeful fingers crossed it might, may still be possible but uh, it's just captivating and that one that back that back road that leads to Los Olivos I mean that's just you know one of the most beautiful places in wine, in the wine world. Yeah, you feel like you know, you're know you entering into a, an AVA. You know, when you get on that road, you feel the temperature change and it's small enough that you can see it and understand it. For me, for an AVA to exist, that helps so much to be able to see it and to be able to point from one position and say, I understand that vineyard versus this, versus this, versus this. And Ballard's always had that, 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 that ease of, of understanding. And it's just, it's so crystal clear. So for people who maybe haven't had a chance to taste these wines, do you think, or, or, or who are just sort of want to learn about Ballard Canyon, would you say that it is the temperature that's the, the main sort of like signature or is it the, because you've got both pretty flat vineyards and you've got hillside vineyards, so it's not going to be that so much, but is it, is it the soils, those sandy soils we talked about? Is it more temperature? Is it, uh, I don't know, diurnal shifts? I mean, what are the, like, what if you were teaching like a master class on Ballard Canyon, what are like the two or three things that like, you know, it's like boom, boom, boom. You know, I, I think the soils are always fascinating. I'm, I'm a soil scientist by passion and by training. And I don't know that that's the picture of Ballard, you know, because, because our neighbors, the Stoltmans and the Beckmans make, you know, world-class yeah. exquisite wines that are on limestone, you know, clay on top of limestone. And then we're a pure sand dune, you know, and, and Rusak kind of falls in between and Larner, et cetera. To me, it's that North-South Valley 
where you're coming off, you're branching off the Santa Rita Hills in essence, and you get that inland warmth, which is, I mean, it gets warm. Uh, but you also, at like one o'clock every day, you can set your watch by it and you'll be up there. It'll be 89 degrees, 90 degrees. The vines are starting to shut down. The stomata are starting to close. The vines are calling it quits for photosynthetic, you know, metabolism for the day. And then the breeze comes up and you drop eight degrees, 10 degrees. All of a sudden the vines continue their photosynthetic journey. And so you get that, that huge diurnal shift as well, which is those hot daytime temperatures and nights that are so cold that you maintain freshness, acidity. It's that combination of like really bold, voluptuous fruit on that very, um, um, I would say concentrated frame of structure and acidity. Yeah. And that, that to me is really what defines it, the temperature shifts and that, that cold influence from the, the Santa Rita Hills. Yeah, so to sort of frame it, the, the, the Western edge of Santa Barbara County is on the Pacific Ocean basically, right? And you've got these different sort of areas. And as you move East, this is what happens. It gets warmer as you just alluded to, right? And then right. You, when you get to Ballard Canyon, you get into this area where you can cultivate these Bordeaux varieties and also Rhone grapes. We'll go west in a second, but now we're gonna we're focusing on on Honada and Ballard Canyon. So it's that combination, I guess, right? Ultimately, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I, I always talk about this, but I love this fact, right? Like, you know, when we planted the vineyard, besides the gentleman, you know, tip my hat wherever he is who told us to grow asparagus. Um, you know, a lot of people said if you're going to grow grapes on this vineyard in Ballard Canyon on the sand, historically speaking, you should grow Syrah. And as a history buff as well, I mean, if the Romans built your terraces or the Crusaders brought your grapes back or, you know, you're the Phoenicians, you know, it, 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 we're talking history, right? If your neighbors started planting 10 years before you did, thank goodness they did, but history is a little grandiose. So, you know, you can see this map here. I mean, Assertico. <laughs> That's the <laughs> first thing I noticed. I'm like, we put up the wrong map. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is Santorini. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we, we did them all. We tried them all because we're, we're the first kind of generation coming through this valley and, and adding to the common knowledge of, of what works and what doesn't. And you mix that in with a climate that's rapidly changing. We got to be on our feet. We got to be on our toes. And Syrah does deserve a position. Syrah now is, you know, the second largest planting we have. But, I mean, Sauvignon Blanc ripens next to it and uh, Sangiovese and Semillon and Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Merlot. One yeah, big happy family, right? Yeah, so one of the things that's, I mean, this is a very big ranch. How much, how big is the, the property? The property itself of Honada is 600 acres. We have uh, 82, maybe 83 acres planted currently to grapes. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is just amazing about this area is that the, like you could probably put all of Chambol Musigny like in, in. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, with space, to, with space to play around it. Yeah. In Honada, I mean, the, the dimension, like just the avenues, just the ro the avenues on your ranch to get, like, say, from the entrance of the house are, you know, really wide. Uh, and But you can just see how diverse this vineyard is just by, I mean, even if you didn't bother to look at the legend, you would just see that the colors are really varied. So you've obviously identified a lot of really unique micro parcels there. Um, we did. Back in 04, we, we found a map from 2004 where there were actually 25 blocks in 2004. That's 50, 54 or 55. So we've, we've subdivided and we've become our own dream come true and our own worst enemy all in one. Um, we, we keep subdividing and it's brilliant, but it makes for blending nightmares and headaches, but it's worth every, every second. And so you were there um, at, though at the very beginning, right? Yeah, when I came on though, it was planted. It was planted. Okay, got it. Yeah, so it was planted in 2000. We've, we've changed everything okay. since then, but, but it was planted in 2000. The first harvest was 04. We actually dropped fruit in 03. Oh. Um, I, I showed up with boots on the ground in 04, and that was where we got, got rolling. Yeah, that's where I got the numbers mixed up. The, your first vintage coincides with the first harvest, but not the planting. Correct, yeah. The yeah. First, exactly. yeah. And do you know where the clonal material was, uh, came from for all these, all these different plots? I do, yeah. We, uh, I mean, we have, we have a, 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 a quite a spectrum. We have, I mean, Syrah clones. I think we have 11 Syrah clones on the property. Some of them, you know, uh, most recently we went and got Laurel Glen, Cabernet Sauvignon. We got... Um, Laurel Glen is a vineyard in, in uh, 
Sonoma Mountain, which is a fantastic vineyard. Fantastic. The 85, yeah. 86, 87. Uh, the, we got um, two clones from our friends up at Ridge. We got wow. um, um, the Cuesta clone from our friends up at, uh, um, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And, and you know, we have VCC, um, Cabernet Franc, you name it, we have tried it. Some of them don't work, but some of them work famously. And, and we feel like the map that's shown on there now, we're firing on all cylinders, I think, across the blocks. Cool. Uh, we have a question from David before I forget, because I think it's topical here. The Honata is a historical name for this area, right? Yeah. So naming a vineyard is, and naming a wine project, I would say, is, is a lot harder than naming a child in some odd ways. Uh, I copyrighted. <laughs> exactly right but um, you know we wanted to find a name that really spoke about the place specifically and the original land grant I think in 1842 when this was New Spain basically was Rancho San Carlos de Hanata and it was given to two brothers uh, from Mexico and Hanata is this really wonderful word if you know the history of our little valley it's an um, English corruption, of a Danish corruption, of a Spanish corruption, of a Pura Semeno Native American word that means tall oak trees. And I think phonetically, I think the original pronunciation of it had like a bunch of X's in it. So I think we've, we've maybe moved on from the original pronunciation, but it is the most historically relevant word for our piece of dirt that, that we could find. And it's just, you know, th this is an incredibly rich Spanish history here, and it seemed the proper way to go for it. Yeah, you know, for people who haven't visited Santa Barbara, I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating, I mean, you're going to laugh at me, Matt. <laughs> I happened to watch Sideways the other day, and I was like, God, I really miss the area. But, yeah, right. one of, but one of the things that is unique here is you have a, I mean, a lot of California is like this, but I think Santa Barbara's maybe got a little bit more of a, a very diverse cultural mix, Spanish roots, Latino roots, uh, European Danish roots, um, Native in, uh, American roots, and then of course, you know, more Western roots. And you, you see that show up in a lot of different areas. And I think it's one of the things that really, it's just, a, there's a lot of strands to the local culture that you can observe even today. And it's interesting that you, it shows up even in the name of a, of a, of a ranch today. It's pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that's such a phenomenal point people don't talk about very often. I mean, you have have the, the Chumash tribe and you have, you know, you have the old Spanish families, you have young, you have young families from Mexico coming, you know, it's, it's a, it is a, um, it's a microcosm that's quite fantastic. I think it's, it's emblematic and I think it's, it's a big defining element to our wines. It's a great point. Um, tell us about this one, El Desafio de Jonata is a Cabernet Sauvignon based wine, right? So you have, um, yeah. you have a, you have a Merlot based, Basically, right? There's a Merlot-based wine, a Cabernet Franc-based wine, and then yeah. a Cabernet Sauvignon-based wine of the Bordeaux yeah. variety. Yeah, so, so, so basically, yeah, we, we started in 04, and the question was, what grapes that we grow have a voice loud enough to demand a bottling? And Cab Franc did, Cab Sav did, Merlot did, Petit Verdot did. The Desafio, you know, is a Cabernet-based blend. It's not always even 75%, but the desafio is the defiance or the challenge. And it's our tip of the hat again. Thank you very much for telling us to grow asparagus. And, you know, it's, it's been with us ever since, you know, and, and for the first couple of years, we wanted to always send that to our friend in France and put on a little, uh, couple of little sprigs of asparagus and tie it around. But, you know, the cab where we are, I'm, I'm a cab, you know, that was my first love, I would say. I'm not gonna say I'm a Cabernet person. It's not how I define myself, but I certainly loved it first. And cab to me needs to be herbal and cooling and, and minty. That's part of its nature and tannic. And the cab down here is noticeably different. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, one of the wines that I really like that you make a lot, we don't have today, um, but your pairing label, which is, yeah. are those still line priced at 25 bucks a bottle? Cause I mean, that's incredible. 25 uh, bucks a bottle, never, never changed. And yeah. they kind of deliver that same complexity and freshness, sure. Yeah, so I know you'll never tell me where the Cabernet comes from, but that wine is usually uh, very, very delicious, especially for the price. It's all from Argentina, always. It's all from Argentina. <laughs> oh, not the clone. From the but this wine's very elegant and delicate. And, and you know, I think uh, um, 
it's nice to taste the Cabernet that tastes like Cabernet. Yeah, that's and that's that's the thing. I love it. I remember balance. the first couple of years that I, when I made that, I'd go to, to tastings and they would say, interesting, it doesn't taste like Napa. Yeah. And it felt like kind of a punch to the stomach. And now I want to give them a hug and say, exactly. I love Napa, but we're six hours south. It shouldn't taste like Napa. Yeah, I mean, but this is very Cabernet. I mean, yeah. very varietal. Another wine that you guys make that I think is is because the wines, the Honada wines are, are mostly at a you know sort of middle and upper price range, but you make that wine called Todos, which means everything in Spanish. So that's kind of your kitchen sink blend, I think. And that wine's a really great value too. Yeah, I mean, the, the joy of that wine for me is that, you know, when we go into the market and I get to talk about what we do, it's a very concise story. And, and really it's it's everything we do under one cork. So it's every grape we grow and it tastes like the, the, the property. It has that wild edge, but also the very um, kind of refined level of tannin. And it's a bunch of different grapes playing very nicely together. Yeah. Well, on one, of things, well, yeah one of the things I love about that wine is you always put it in the tasting somewhere in the middle. It's never like the first wine that you taste. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think when you can put your $50 wine or whatever it is that it costs now, but when you can put your wine in that price range in the middle of these other wines, which are in a different category, and it's not like you you don't perceive this sort of dip and then this you know and that, i mean that's a wine that i think people should be looking out for as well because um it's always pretty impressive um san Giovese, you still make some i'm still holding on to that 0.5 acres out there okay. every year i love it so much we don't make it every year i mean it's a it's a temperamental grape and when we make it though i just i adore it you know we will keep it good and then there's this wine sangre Ah, la sangre. No, we... Which a lot of people would say is the sort of the flagship wine or the most representative wine. You may, I mean, I'm sure if you make those wines, you would never. It's hard to think that because you love them all. But what's the what's the what's the story with the sangre? You know, I, for me, the, the sangre. The, there are three wines to me that are, that are the top of the production. It's Alma Desafio, uh, so the Cabernet Franc, the Cabernet Sauvignon, and the Syrah. Syrah is nice because Syrah is easier to work with, I would say, to be brutally honest. I think Syrah on its own is just such a magnificently complete and compelling grape. Um, the Sangre has changed over time as our vineyard has evolved and matured, but the, I mean, the, it's such a joyful grape. Syrah just, it has enough fruit sweetness and, and gaminess and kind of sophistication and complexity and sensuality it's it's really the perfect grape for where we are. So between that and Cab and Cab Franc, it depends on the vintage, but Syrah probably has been the most consistent, arguably. And the Sangre just, it was the easiest wine to name, I'll tell you that much. I think blood. that took us about two minutes to come up with that name. Blood, yeah. And, but one of the things about this wine is, it, I mean, I think all of the wines have had a, I'm sure it's very hard to make a wine in a first vintage from a place that has like basically no track record. And I mean, I'm sure that that's unbelievably hard, but one of the things that's definitely happened with these wines is that they've evolved towards a style of more freshness and more aromatics. And the, the first vintages were really super concentrated and super rich. And this wine, 15, I mean, that's the year that had a brutal heat in the middle and very dry, but the wine is very aromatic and lifted. And if you didn't know the vintage, it's, I think it'd be very hard to say, ah, that's 15. It's really very fresh. So. Tell us about the arc of evolution and the thought there at Honata over the years. A ton of it, you know, I think a ton of it is, is just via a vineyard maturation. You know, I, I think we, we, we moved into a window of, of the vines at their apex, at their very best. Uh, I think part of it too is, look, vineyards mature, so do winemakers, <laughs> you know? I think early on we were extracting and we were extending macerations and whole cluster and let's go. And we've kind of moved to a point almost like spinal tap, like don't look at it, don't touch it, don't think about it, don't touch it, right? Where we'll do a fermentation and we'll pump it over once a day for two minutes. There's no pigeage, you know, we're not, we're not punching down, we're not really getting in there and, and, and working it and just keeping it fresh. You know, I, I think we've learned a lot. The, the, the journey has been very humbling and that vineyard is so reactive because of the sandy soil content that you have to listen really, really, really closely to the vines every day i mean this wine has a red color the first wines were like black black and yeah open an 05 sangre and decant it for like 
four days, <laughs> you know? And are you adding Viognier to Syrah? On a, it's more vintage to vintage, right? You know, on occasion we will. Um, we, we tend to use, uh, this is, if there's any Viognier lovers out there, please turn off your, 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 your connection. Um, I actually like Viognier stems. I don't especially like the grapes. Mm -hmm. So there have been days where we will bring in Viognier with the Syrah, de-stem it, press the Viognier as Viognier, and then throw the stems in the, in the ferment. Our Viognier mm -hmm. stems are like, wine. yeah, yeah. yeah. We make a white wine and then we'll bring in the, the stems and some of the skins from Viognier minus the juice to make, I mean, not that we need a darker wine, but to make a more aromatically lifted wine, the stems are like green peppercorn in excelsis. Like they're just heavenly. Um, Do you dry the stems or are they just, they're fresh going to the tank? We, we've dried them. I, I prefer, you know, we'll let them sit for a day. Um, it's oftentimes very nice to kind of dry the stems for a day to get rid, rid of some of the sap from the, the cuts to dry yeah. the resin. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Over the course of, of the last 16 years, we've done a little bit of everything. I mean, we've done pasito or we've, you know, we've really laid it out in the sun. We've, we've pushed the boundaries, pushed the envelope a little bit, but, but the Viognier, we do still maybe one or 2% into the sangre. Mm. That's the wine showing really great. Um, tell us about the, the Hilt project. How, when did, how did that come about? <laughs> Look, I mean, this region, like you were saying, it's, it's not that big, you know, I mean, from Santa Barbara to Buellton, Buellton to Lompoc, or even, even from, let's be more, more, I guess, uh, specific from Santa Inez, which is Happy Canyon, to Solvang, Buellton, which is Ballard Canyon, to Lompoc, you can make the drive in 30 minutes. You can make the drive in 30 minutes. What's that? You can make the drive in 30 minutes. My Prius is speedy, speedy little <laughs> Prius. Yeah. But I mean, you're, you're, but you're crossing worlds of wine, wouldn't you agree? Where you're crossing from, <laughs> from really Cab and Sau uh, Sauvignon Blanc country to Syrah country to like the coldest possible California production of, of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Yeah. So while while we started Honada, two grapes that like obviously m were not on that list are, are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and as fanatics of Burgundy, uh, fanatics of, of, of California, Oregon, Pinot and Chardonnay of Finger Lakes. I mean, I, I love this stuff coming out of New York. Um, we knew we wanted to do that. And we knew we were in a place where we could make some of the finest in the world. We just had to find a home. And so from 2004 to 2014, we made wines of style. While we did our diligence, I would say, and while we sat and checked out every little corner, we bought fruit from every little corner and we found where where we could make the wines we wanted to, which were a Chardonnay that was really defined by electricity. I mean, the saline quality, but electricity, shocking, like incredibly fresh. And for the Pinot, we wanted darkness. We wanted structure, the tannic structure. We wanted um, um, a little bit more complexity, the kind of hint of corruption I always talk about, the stuff that makes Pinot so lovely. Uh, and we found our home that gave us both at the Hilt which it started off its life as buying fruit, right? While you were scoping out the vineyards. Absolutely, yeah, we, we bought and we did our diligence. And you had old guard cuvées for both and vanguard cuvées yeah. for both. And the old guard was the wines you're talking about, a little bit more focused, vanguard a little bit more, I hate the word modern, but you know, just a little bit more textured and creamier, yeah. right? In style. And over time, we've kind of, over time we've moved towards wines of place. Every year, the magnifying glass goes up a couple times. The yeah. magnitude increases so that now we're actually making Vanguard Old Guard, but making the estate, which is, you know, our property in the southwest corner of the Santa Rita Hills. And then we're making single vineyards and which I always push back on because I wanted to make sure the single vineyards were worthy of bottling. Yeah. You know, and Where does I wanted to mean something for the consumer. Yeah. Where does the Hilt name originate from? We have that question. Yeah. From the fact that at the end of the day, what we do exceptionally well is farm. Um, we have an owner who, who owns some of the great vineyards of the world, and he hires really young, passionate teams and t gives them the directive of go out and farm this to the hill, farm this the absolute highest quality you can. Yes, and but, that really defines what we do. Yeah, so for folks watching, those, are, those, uh, those properties include Screaming Eagle and Bono de Bartre, you know. Right, right. Little one in Napa, little one in Burgundy. It's, little one in Burgundy. 
exactly. And so, so this is your estate. This is the Hill estate in the Santa Rita Hills. Yeah. So that's, that's Bent Rock specifically, which, you know, we are as far, we are literally the Southwest corner of the AVA. The AVA actually runs that fire road you can see in that map. And we are about 10 miles away from the ocean. It is, Bent Rock is actually protected and, and, and a little bit more deeper soils. It's not quite as extreme. And Radiant is the meanest place I've ever seen. I always joke that, it, you know, we could get into the poison oak and rattlesnake business if we ever got out of the grape industry. <laughs> and what would you say, I mean, you make, you, but obviously these are both very big ranches, right? So you make some of the wine yourself, but you also sell fruit to quite a few people, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a long-term part of the plan. So where Honada is 600 acres with 80 planted, this property, uh, the Hill property is about 3,600 acres and we have 200 planted. And we have strategic relationships, you know, we have partners we'll sell fruit to for, for forever, you know, and we also cherry pick blocks that we wanna keep on our own. And we're doing a fair amount of development as far as moving grapes around. I think there's a great conversation to be had about what are the most relevant grapes in Santa Rita? Um, is it Chard, is it Pinot, is it Syrah, is it, something we haven't considered yet. I think everything's on the table, but um, so here's, sorry, Radian you put up. Radian is, you could see the white chalky or the, the diatomaceous earth. Up here. I've never seen a vineyard like this in my life. Yeah. It is steep, so windy that leaves get ripped off of plants, which is hard. That's a lot of wind. And the skins get incredibly thick. The wines get very dark, but the acid is, you know, we've never bottled a Chardonnay over 3.2 pH, uh, about eight and a half grams. And I mean, the Pinots are just. Yeah, and this is your 17 radian. Yeah, oh, okay, that's a, that's a serious one. So, um, interesting vintage with a lot of dry weather in the middle and heat around harvest. How did you, what, what's the harvest like in Santa Barbara for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay? Do they happen more or less at the same time? Is the Chardonnay much later? Because this is one of the features that's pretty unique, I think. You know, if Mother Nature is being benevolent, there will be a slight break between them. More often than not, we're bringing in, they, the, the, the height can actually cross over. We tend to bring in Pinot a little bit later. Um, we tend to pick Chardonnay a little bit on the earlier side. And our Pinot, just to get it ripe, you know, to get it to even a percentage of 13, we got to let it hang for a while. But the Shard comes in usually last week of August to maybe the middle of September. And we'll pick Pinot into first, second week of October. Okay. So now on these ranches, you're doing single vineyard wines, which are pretty new. Yeah, yeah, very new. Um, and then you have the, an estate bottling as well. Yeah, the estate bottling is probably the most complete for me. And, you know, maybe it's because I come from a Bordeaux background where... I love the thought of a complete compelling wine, right? Where, where you don't have holes. I mean, holes can be fun. Holes can be exciting. Holes can be like uh, complexing and make you want to stick your nose back in the glass because there's something that is missing or something that's off center. For me, being able to make the estate with that yin and yang, with that like blood orange quality and roundness from Bent Rock with that really tense electric black kind of uh, 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 um, mayhem that we get off of Radian is wonderful. For the single vineyards, I mean, it's crazy. We've owned it since 14 and we didn't make a single vineyard until 17. Yeah. It wasn't because the quality wasn't there. It was more a question of, uh, it had to pass the sniff test for me. I have a hard time with, with a lot of domestic Pinot's single vineyard bottlings because if it's from a really young vineyard, what does it mean to the consumer? Yeah. What does it mean? We, we don't know what those taste like yet. Yeah. So we did a tasting where with my incredibly talented team I have working with me. I'm so blessed. We tasted 20 wines in blind. We all had to say radian, bent rock, bent rock, radian, radian, bent rock, right? Get them all. They have to be singular, specific. And then once they passed that test, were they complete and delicious? I mean, it's not rocket science for us to do that, but, but in 17, they both were delicious. 
That's a really hard exercise. I'm glad I, you didn't ask me what I thought. I'm sure I would have gotten it wrong <laughs> because the, the personality of those vineyards to me is very different for Pinot Noir and for Chardonnay. Absolutely. So it's, it's not just because, sure. yeah, one vineyard might give you the more taut wine and Pinot Noir. The actually the inverse is true of Chardonnay. So it's, you got to really know your stuff. That's hard. Really Next hard. time you come out, we'll do it. No, we'll, spot. we'll get on Instagram. We'll go on. Uh, we'll go on Zoom together. Yeah, you can do it live. <laughs> Look, you got them all wrong. <laughs> it's the date. It's Zero on. for twenty. <laughs> um, okay, so these the Hilt wines. So when they say estate, does because you can use the word estate in California for wines that are also farmed through long term contracts. So when Correct. you say estate for the Hilt, does it mean? That by definition for you guys, rating and bet rock only, or could there be other stuff in there? Yeah, for the Chardonnay, yes. Um, uh, or for the, actually, for the Chardonnay and Pinot, we do still use a small amount of San for Benedict, which we've farmed since 2008. And not in a loose sense farming, but actually complete control. Um, the, we've had a good partnership with the Torlados and been able to really work with the old vines there. And over time, you know, we're really focusing more on Radiant Bent Rock as we move forward. But those vineyards are gorgeous. And those wines are quite lovely. Nice addition to have. Well, Sanford and Benedict is probably the most famous vineyard in the Santa Rita Hills and all of Santa Barbara, with the exception of the Anacito as well. But I mean, those are vineyards first planted in the 70s. Yeah. I think only, only uh, it would have to be maybe the original Peter Martin Ray vineyard, but there's not a lot of vineyards that have a longer history river bench in santa maria which is around the same time as bienecito more or less early 64 70s. maybe 64 yeah. is the uh, nielsen yeah nielsen, yeah but i mean you're talking about the top the, the three or four or five vineyards that are kind of like the heritage vineyards for pinot and chardonnay in this country and those that's one of them yeah and the fact is to just to talk about a legend you know richard sanford to me is like such a legend the fact that it was a completely blank slate and he walked upon a completely blank slate and said through his proverbial like dart and was like, that's where I want to plant. And it happened to be maybe the finest site, certainly one of the finest sites in, I would say in the world for Pinot and Chard. Yeah. And, and, you know, we took a cue from that and where we bought our property, our property is a number of miles to the West, a little bit colder and more exposed to the wind, but you know, there's something, there's magic from SMB for sure. We, yeah. we weren't blind to that. Yeah. And uh, we've got a lot of great questions um, that we're going to get to in just one second, but I'm just curious, what has been the role of climate change in Santa Barbara County since the time you've been there? And was that part of the decision why you went that far west or was it just that that land was so enticing for a variety of other reasons? Such a good question. You know, I, I, I ask myself that question all the time and I go back through my notes and I remember looking through and finding notes where I said, wow, not a normal vintage based on the first two vintages, like 06, for example. But then the new normal four years later when or, you know, 2010 came around and said, not a normal vintage. I, I don't know what a normal vintage is anymore. I don't know what our, our normal climate is for any given vintage because it's been a bit scattershot. And I think the move to the, like, the coldest, literally the coldest site in Santa Rita Hills was a move we made. I mean, we were, we were sentient to the fact that we wanted to move as close to the coast as we could. And the site we picked, specifically Radian, I mean, it, it goes through a lot of years without getting to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, that's cold. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a warm region one, basically. Um, so that did play a role, but as far as the, the, um, the climate change, we're seeing odd fluctuations and heat spike. We're seeing odd fluctuations with, wet, with, with rain. And I don't know where it's going to land. It's always a moving target, but it's something that we're grappling with on a yearly basis. And it's something that is on our mind all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, we had bud break this year at, at Bent Rock on the 19th of February in some cases. Wow. So, I mean, that would be picking in July, <laughs> you know, luckily things pushed back a month. So now we're into August, but it's, that's, that's not really ideal. So we're hoping that we get more late rain in years to come. It cools the soils down a little bit. Yeah, well, that's remarkable. I mean, yeah, I think when people think about climate change, most, the most natural thing to assume is that the summers are much warmer, but it's actually the, the disruptions in other times of the year 
that are generally times of rest, winter, for example, that's yeah. possibly even more impactful um, than warm weather in the summer. Because you, you sort of right. expect it to be warm in the summer. It's just maybe a little bit warmer. But it's then, the freak events in the winter that really throw things off. Ooh. Yeah, it's really cool. Dry periods um, with heat in the winter are troubling, really troubling. Yeah. So let's take some questions because we've got some really good ones. Uh, so Shay asks, he says, I'm a bit, well, I'm not sure if it's a he or she, but um, I'm a big Cabernet Franc fan and enjoy tasting it in the Hanada wines. How do you think Franc expresses itself in Santa Barbara compared to other California regions? It's a great question. Um, I mean, the annoying answer is it is specifically Santa Barbara style. Uh, Cabernet Franc is funny. It's so frustrating. I mean, we all know Rougeard. We all know uh, uh, Bernard uh, uh, Bergau, all those, all those, or not Bergau, um, Baudry, that brilliant producer of Machino. And I look up to those wines, but here the wine is so very drastically different. And when Cabernet Franc is at its peak, it blows Syrah out of the water. Yeah. When it is less than peaking, it is the worst wine in our cellar. And it has that innate ability to, to frustrate the heck out of us. The way I would define the Honada style is we get directly into that window where it still is full of pyrazine. Like you're still green and herbal, cool, minty, but you also have to rely on the bittersweet baking chocolate quality in the right ratio. And it's, you know, people say Pinot Noir is the heartbreak grape. I think Cabernet Franc is the most difficult grape we work with by far. Yeah. And it, when it's good and green and black and red, it's, it's the finest thing we make. Yeah, no, that's true. The, wine, the styles of the wines can be pretty wide. And I imagine also if you were to make, let's say, 10 vintage, the vintage variation is going to be pretty, oh, it's yeah. pretty crazy. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. the difference between 16, 15, 14, those are, they have a tie that binds them, but it's stretched thin in some cases. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So Randy asks if there's any varieties that were planted at Honata that did not work out or that were w markedly different from their benchmarks. Huh. I think for the first uh, four vintages, Merlot failed to hit the mark. And being young and a little bit reactive, we decided to tear it out. Where we now know that Grenache and Merlot are late bloomers. And Syrah and Cab are early bloomers. Syrah and Cab, the first vintage of Syrah on any given vintage could be legendary. The first four vintages of Merlot are pretty bad. Uh, we brought Merlot back from the dead here and we have the Phoenix now. But the other grape that I think suffered just from overplanting originally was Semion. I mean, no offense to the original planting, but who needs eight or nine acres of Semion? <laughs> you know, I, I love it as a blender. I love what my friend like Matt Rourke does with it up in, in the Sierra foothills. I love what they do with it over in the Hunter Valley. But here, it adds a little richness to our, our Sauvignon Blanc, but Botrytis is not really in the cards here, sadly. So Semion lost a lot of acreage. And much like the Sangiovese, I fight every year to keep that one acre intact. Got it's it. good for the soul. But those are really the only two that failed. Okay. Here's a really cool question, which I really want to hear your answer to from John. He asks, is the 2018 vintage as great as it is rumored to be? How does it compare to 2017 and 2016? I love the 18. I think the 18 has better balance than both. I think 17, um, I adore 17, but, but it dealt with that monsoonal period. I mean, it was bizarre. It poured on us. It was a, that, that, that almost like a tornado event out here, followed by some, some kind of warm and wet periods. And 16 was just, it's so epically wonderful and opulent. But to me, the fruit, you know, they're, I'm pulling hairs here. They're, they're both incredible. 18 has the freshness of say, like, um, like an eight or a freshness of, it's almost like seven to me, 2007, where you had that incredible density plus that freshness. Um, it's very light on its feet. It's very complex. Uh, it shows the age of the vines very well. 18 is magical. 16 and 17, to be fair, are two of my favorite vintages we've made ever. Mm -hmm. But 18, the blending process was very seamless. All the wines came together very well. That's for Pinot and Chard, absolutely, but also for Honada. So when those two coincide with great vintages, life is good. Yeah, I mean, I was really fortunate last June to taste a bunch of 18s from the barrel, and I was mm -hmm. really... 
I mean, I wrote about it, so it's not like it's a secret, but I was just really <laughs> mesmerized by these wines. You know, I mean, I've never tasted wines like that in Santa Barbara County. Wines that have that combination of unctuous, sweet fruit, you know, which you would associate, usually you associate that with a warm vintage, the body, the texture, but with the aromatics and the perfume and the complexity, and then this tannin that's very sweet, and it's just like sort of wraps around everything. Like, I mean, I just can't, to me, there's, it's really hard. I mean, you know these wines better than me, but I can't say that it's like any other vintage. Do you, do you think, I mean, from your time here, would you relate that to another vintage? Does well, 18 thing, I just think it's really hard to, it's really hard to find a, a something that's equal because you, because that wine, those, that vintage has such personality, such yeah. character, you know, and it's, it is more, it's sweeter and riper. Well, I don't know if it's riper analytically, but the, the textural impression and the weight of the wine leads you to think that the wines are really ripe and luscious, which they are. And that is really sweet tannin, but you're, you're, Usually when you get that, you've you've given up something in the aromatic presence of a wine. Right. And in the 18, you're not giving up anything. You still have all of that, especially in Pinot Noir. You've got these wines like, you know, I remember tasting like Domaine de la Cote, you know, with Raj Parr and Sashi Mormon. And they just pour this wine into like your glass and it's, you know, like this explosion of like, you know, and like, you know, when you're like the hair and your arm stands up, it's like, wow. And those, you know, these are wines of really great presence. And I just, I can't wait to taste them in a bottle, so. You know, it's interesting, 18, the 18 could literally still be hanging on the vines. <laughs> you know, the 18, the, the season just never ended. There was no need to pick it ever. And, yeah. you know, even people who picked in November were probably picking it, you know, a, a, an incredible level of freshness. So yeah, that, that's amazing to hear you say that. I like that. Yeah. So here's a question from your colleague and friend, Fred Chad Novel. No, oh, God, don't ask it. This okay, is a family next. program. <laughs> he says um what do you typically see as uh, see or smell or taste as the difference between sand and clay soils as it relates to pinot noir I'm trying to think i haven't dealt with as much sand and pinot noir you know it's interesting and, and I, chad and i have this conversation from time to time you know the, the, the uh, hilt property is unique in the sense that even though it's on the Santa Rosa Road corridor, it's so driven by diatomaceous earth that it's kind of an anomaly. It's kind of its own island. Um, what I see with varying degrees of clay and diatom are massive, absolutely freakishly different. Um, a lot of it has to do with everything in, in, in wine is, is interrelated. It's hard to separate one specific tangent or aspect, but where we have exposed DE, pure amorphous diatomaceous earth, we also have wind, <laughs> you know? So the combination of those two makes skins that are about a mile thick on berries that are about a BB size, um, where the more profound soils lead to larger clusters, the clay content is water holding capacity, um, the skins are not quite as thick, seeds tend to not be as, 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 as demonstrative in the wine. But as far as the black sand that I know Chad and, and those incredible producers have on the Santa Rosa Road side, or the, I'm sorry, the 246 side, yeah. you know, we, we don't have as much experience, to be honest. Um, we've only dealt with like the Botea uh, over at, um, at uh, uh, SNB and some of that surficial uh, banded shirt. And I know how that reacts. And it's, it's a famous combination. But as far as the black sand, I can't compare and contrast the two. I hope Chad isn't crying out there. I hope that's a good enough answer. Well, if he is, he'll let me know. Suffice until you guys can duke it out in person. Uh, <laughs> exactly. We're talking about the Santa Rita Hills, which is a fascinating area just in itself because you talked about that 246 corridor, which would include vineyards like Zodovich and Melville um, and, um, and um, Chad's neighbor, whose name escapes me when I'm about to name him. Brian Babcock. Brian. Babcock. Yeah. And so those are sandy soils. You get these wines that are very perfumey, yeah. very you know ethereal and lifted. Um, those small grapes and that windy exposure that you talk to would be like Mount Carmel, right? Where you make Mail Road. Absolutely, it's that's a very similar, except that that's the southern aspect. Yeah, and all of the hilt is absolutely northern aspect. Yeah, and so and when you're so at Mount Carmel, you're actually looking across the valley to Sanford and Benedict, which is a most amazing view. Huh. So all within one appellation, you have that 246 area where Chad is, you have Sanford and Benedict, which, which is like a bowl. 
-hmm. you look across and you have uh, sea smoke and yeah. then on top of that mount carmel and where you make mail road yeah. now where etienne de monti owns his vineyard that he leased or bought from the wenslows from Wenslow, yeah absolutely and then you have your area where yeah. you have um radiant and bent rock yeah. and you have domaine de la Cote. i mean it's like just yeah. like that is so complicated <laughs> Say Siega, you have Labarge, you have you have a, a SMB, obviously a Black and Tatum and Canada. You know, and that's, and speaking of our friend, ooh, speaking of my dog, um, speaking of our friend Chad, you know, we had this great conversation about at what point do we look at subdividing some of these AVAs? And we had decided it was probably still too early because our strength is in numbers and we're all still learning what the differences are. That being said, we're putting together these incredible tastings um this well it was supposed to be this summer we'll see when we can get together and break bread and pop corks together but um ABA by ABA a little section northeast southeast the middle kind of the, the north facing south facing as producers do we taste a difference do we taste something worth subdividing or is it is it still just a, a, a grand taste of San Rita Hills that's a like a million dollar question because if you subdivide it too much, then it becomes too, you know, you have all these tiny little AVAs. It's kind of hard to deal with for the, the average consumer. Never understand. And then it's not fair to the consumer. It's not fair to our friends. The sommeliers is not friend to, you know, it's not fair to to retailers. It's a mess. For now, our power is in numbers, but the the different dimensions are so singular that one day it probably deserves to be divided up. One day. Uh, a few people have asked, what do you? What are your thoughts on decanting your wines? Is it very different from the Hilt de Honata, like, you know, Burgundy varieties versus Rhone and Bordeaux, or is it more like how you make the wines dictates the kind of aeration that you like for your, for your wines? Oh, that's not a softball. Somebody's throwing curveballs at me. That's not fair. Hey, not my question. <laughs> Whoever that is, I'm coming. I might've added, I might've added something on the end. <laughs> no, the look. It came from, from, from Marshall. <laughs> okay, now I know. Uh, no, Honada, Honada is freakish. Uh, Honada for years. I remember in 2007, we had just bottled the 05. And um, I went on vacation to France and I came back and we had opened a bottle two weeks before and we left it an 05 Sangre, about a third full. And after two weeks, it had opened to a point where it was stunning and had violets for the first time. And we realized because the tannic, the tannic content of the Honada Reds, specifically the Desafio, the Alma, and, and the Sangre, that, I mean, now we recommend in some cases if people are impatient, like I am, to be fair, and they want to open a young wine when they get it in the mail, we say pop the cork, taste it, double decant it back to bottle, leave it for 48 or 72 hours, and then drink it. And that sounds like mayhem to a lot of people. It sounds crazy, like chaos. But with the Honada Reds, even the floor, Sauvignon Blanc, Something about that, that, that property makes wines that really can benefit from that aeration. With a couple of years in bottle, I don't think it's necessary. I think pop and pour is very possible. With the hilt, it's interesting that the Chardonnay oftentimes actually does, requires more decanting than the Pinot. And that's a strange one for me, but it's very true. You know, the older I've gotten, I'm not a big fan of decanting in general, but the older I've gotten, I'm much more likely to decant the white wine than a red wine. You know, Chablis or Santa Barbara Chardonnay or Riesling or anything that's kind of a more nervy kind of white almost always does better with decanting reds. I don't know. I don't really bother that much. But on the subject of decanting, a lot of times when I've come to visit you, you'll we'll taste two bottles of each wine, yeah. right? You have the one that you decanted like the night before and the one that you open right then and there. And it's really amazing to see the, and that's just an arc of 24 hours yeah. or, you know, wines that have just been recently bottled. Yeah, it, it's always it's always a crapshoot, to be honest. We, we never completely understand what's going to happen with those wines with the air, and, and we like to show everything that can. You know, that sometimes they react well. Sometimes they react adversely to air, and, and to be fair, we like to see it ourselves. You know, we like to understand better on our end. Right. But for, for young Honada, I can, I can speak that, that 72 hours of decanting is. But who does that? Who, who I yeah. certainly don't. I don't come home and think, on Wednesday, I think we're going to order that nice ribeye so yeah. on Monday, let's get into <laughs> Monday, 8 a.m. Let's decant this. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. Um, one of the, uh, so Patrick asks, what's given proper cellaring, what do you see as being the, the optimal drinking window for the Hanada Reds? Uh, you know, 
I have a strange take on that, but because it's my palate, uh, I tend to prefer uh, wines from Santa Barbara County in, on their youthful side. I've had the pleasure to taste, I mean, wines back to like Sanford Benedict 1976 Cabernet Sauvignon and they're stunning and they'll last. And they're amazing. And like Brian Babcock, Shards and Peels, uh, uh, Greg Brewer, everything he makes like ages impeccably, right? Um, and is always better with 10, 15 years of age. But, but my palate really kind of veers towards the vibrancy, the, the, the freshness, that voluminous kind of fruit um, and the saltiness that you get in the first 10 years of consumption. So I like to drink, you know, an eight year old Chard. I like to drink a, a six or seven year old Pinot. Are there exceptions? No doubt, but, but I prefer to capture that, that, that vivid snapshot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always a very fine line. Obviously, personal preference is a huge driver of this, but there's a difference between how long will a wine last and how long, and then at what point does it stop sort of improving and developing complexity? Because the, the reason you sell a wine is the, the underlying concept of that is you, you, you accept or you believe that the wine is going to be better in five years or 10 years or 20 years than it is now. And there's plenty of wines that can age, that can last, but they're not necessarily getting better or improving, you know, but then, then you have to create the matrix with like your own personal taste. And I would say, yeah, probably 10 to 12 years is eight to 10. I don't know, depending on the wine, the vintage is kind of the sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have people who call me, you know, and they'll say, you know, I, I'm still holding on to that 2004 rosé. When should I pop the cork? You know, and I get it because we, we hold on to special bottles, but, but I certainly, I, I appreciate when people, you know, open a couple bottles every couple of years to make sure that the wine status is, is, is yeah. alive and well. And I think that falls on the producers as well to keep consumers posted, to keep sommeliers, to keep, to keep, you know, distributors posted on what's drinking well and what's not. Yeah. Mike asks about your new winery, um, the new, Hona it's a combined winery, right? Yeah, everything under one roof, pairing Honada in the hilt. And is it all done now and operational? It's operational. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we made wine there in 19 and there were days, you know, we, we had growing pains. We had, you know, we finished right in the nick of time, which always, always seems to be the case with a construction facility or with a, with a uh, production facility. And we got in there, we made exceptional wines, you know, for the first 15 years of our production, we lived in a tiny warehouse in beautiful downtown Buellton, the city of lights and city of magic. That's where I met you the first time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you thought, yeah, maybe we can meet somewhere else. <laughs> um, but so now we have this kind of non-denominational cathedral of sorts where we have space, we have the ability to taste and focus. We have the ability to, to process as slowly or as quickly as we need to. It's, it's a different world and there will be a tasting room opening, you know, uh, the world kind of when it comes back together, if, if everything falls in a line, we should be opening next, um, I guess, maybe a year from today. Oh, we, good. Well, that's a, a lot to look forward to. Absolutely. We've got time for one more question I can sneak in here from Tom and Linda, who are enjoying a 2004 14 Hilt Old Guard, but they didn't say Pinot or Chard, but it's nice to taste a wine that's five years old, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the 14s, uh, to me, the, the Hilt existed before 14 and then after 14. I think the new age was the buying our home and sourcing fruit from Bent Rock and Radian. And I love those like 13s, 12s. I'm drinking a 2010 Chardonnay from the Hill. I love those wines, but they really were, were part of the process of us getting to the road we're on now. Mm. And I, I, I'm very fond of them. I love them and they led us to where we are. But 14 really is the beginning of, of the story as we now tell it. Well, that's cool. And I think that seems like a perfect place to wrap it up. Matt, thanks so much for your time. It's really a pleasure. Such a pleasure I, to catch up with you. Yeah, I hope I get a chance to see you and your colleagues in person. I have to tell you that every time I go to Santa Barbara, I'm like the happiest person in the world. It's one of my absolute favorite places to be. And I hope it can happen in person this year. Um, but in the meantime, thanks for your time on the Friday afternoon. Thanks to all of our viewers for your fantastic questions. Of course, this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel and Instagram TV and have a great weekend. Cheers. Thanks to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Antonio. It's such a pleasure to see you. Be well. Take care, everybody. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.